And it's okay. Lancaster Woodturners Weekly Coffee Hour on Zoom. This is number 136 in the in the series. Uh, the video for 135 went up yesterday, and it's had about 80 views now or 90 views. And I want to just for a moment before we get going here address the people who watch the videos just for a sec. Um, we, have, we have quite a few people who only watch the videos; and they never come here. And I want to invite them to come here. If you've been, a, if you're on the video and you've enjoyed Coffee Hour, somehow get yourself loose on Thursday morning and get a, get in touch with me, John Kelsey uh, Artisan at gmail.com, uh, and I'll get you. Uh, I'll send you the Zoom link, and you can join us and show us your work. Um, I also want to encourage everybody else on screen here who hasn't shown us work lately to uh, stick your hand up and show us work. You can, you can hold it up, you can uh, share screen, you can email us slides and we'll share screen for you. From here we have a lot of choices for how, how you can show us your work and introduce yourself. So an open invitation especially to people who do not regularly or have not often showed here. Uh, come on along, let us get to know you a little bit. Um, now let me see, having said all that, I have two announcements, uh, well one announcement, Lancaster Club events. Uh, the next meeting of the club is February 7th, Tuesday at 7 o'clock. <coughs> ah, they've, somebody spotlighted me, thank you Bowman. Yes. And the demo will be Mike Kuderback making a Sphericon uh, sort of thing. Um, it will be a demonstration of precision turning to templates and I, I, I've seen him do it. Um, I thought I knew how to do precision turning to a template. Angelo taught me. Angelo's brilliant at it. Kuderback's just as good. Um, so if you'd like to learn anything about that, come on along next Tuesday night. Uh, let's see. And also the week, the Saturday after that, February 11th, will be our February open shop right here in uh, New Holland, PA at 250 Commerce Drive. Uh, let's see. That's 9 to noon. Um, there are four lathes here. We usually have a, a good complement of experts and a good complement of beginners and you can come here and you can show something, you can try something, you can ask questions, you can drink coffee and yakety yak, you can do whatever you want. But it's a great opportunity to meet turners in a very informal way and play on the lathes. So that's the point of the, uh, the, point of the Saturday mornings and they've been very successful show so far. I just wanted to show you that because that was Ziegler walking around with a camera at the last open shop. And we get more people here every time, and we always have a good group of experts and a good group of beginners, and everybody who's come says they have a lot of fun. I think that's true, isn't it, Toby? Did you have a good time? Yes, I did. I mentioned last week it, it was a yeah. very entertaining, and I enjoyed it. Yeah. And Bill, you were here too, weren't you? Bill Major? He hasn't got his mic so, on. Um, yeah, I was there. I, I've been to the last two or three. I wanted to just shout out to Toby. He's the guy that helped me last week. The time before that was Doug Reeser. These guys are really f fantastic with their chisel um, experiences. But I wanted to tell Toby that I came home. I had a chalice on my lathe already, and I, I, I broke a rule. I, I was trying to hollow out the inside of this cup after I had turned the stem. And that's a weak spot. You can't do that. Mine particularly. Huh? <laughs> can't do that. Um, so uh, when I was in there being very careful with my uh, bowl gouge inside of that cup, I put too much pressure on the cut and it cracked the stem of my cup. Yeah. So uh, I learned that I was doing it in the wrong order, of course. Everybody else knew that but me. So anyways, the next one has been started and I'm going to finish the, the end before I work to the bottom and uh, that's thanks to Toby he's he's so gentle with those chisels I couldn't get the light cut that he was getting with mine and that's probably why I was too much pressure so it was it was great meeting Toby he's a lot taller in person than he is on that screen <laughs> <laughs> one of the things we see all the time with beginners is choking up on the tools and and just getting entirely too too tight and too tense and too much strength. Uh, Raffin used to put it this way, let the wood come to you. You don't have to go chase it. I think that lesson learning of always turning from the tailstock to the headstock is one that we, we have to learn the hard way. Yes, especially with goblets, <laughs> goblets and chalices. Yeah, that, that's what I learned. And the, the, the one I'm working on now is very nice. Um, and I'm starting, the next step is to hollow out the inside and there's plenty of wood to support that effort on the other end. So I'm ready to go. Okay. Uh, 
Bill, yep. they make CA glue for that. You didn't make a final. You just made a creative option. So I did, I did put CA glue on it afterwards, but um, <laughs> I also have a stem that has bark in it. It's it's really a strange piece of wood. So I'm trying to save this piece of wood that has natural um, defects in it. And I guess that was a weak spot near that that spot that broke. Oh, yeah. But I did put CA glue on it, and I did uh, put it off to the side until it dries good. Well, the other thing you're going to get if you do a stem that has reaction wood in it or bark in it or like that is it'll probably bend. And so your your formerly tall straight goblet when once the wood finally dries out properly fully will will be a curved stem goblet which is very interesting <laughs> but maybe not what you had in mind. Yeah. Have you got anything else you want to show us today, Bill? I do not. Okay. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to uh, jump the order a little bit and get Roger done here. Roger, are you there somewhere? Where are you? I sure am. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, you want to try your share now? We've been practicing. Okay, we'll give her a try. Got it. Very good. Okay. All right, so this is a little box I turned the other day. That is uh, African walnut is the dark wood and maple for the the, the uh, base of it as well as the knob. So it's about uh, three inches in diameter and about three and a half inches tall. This is a uh, cedar vase that I turned uh, a few weeks ago. A friend of mine gave me a, this chunk of wood that he had started on. He said, I don't know what he said, I'm, I think I'm about ready to throw it out. Why don't you see what you can do? So I turned this, uh, it's, it's about 10 inches tall. I think it's about uh, five and a half, six inches in diameter at the widest spot. And I wanted to show you the back of it here. I added three pewas in the back for that crack. I don't know if you guys have had experience putting these in, but I, I got the template that I use and the uh, the pew is from Big Island engraving over in Hawaii. Is any of you other guys have experience with pews? I've done butterflies in wood tables, but never in a turning. Okay. Uh, Roger, so, hey, Roger, man. Roger, how long have you been turning? Oh, off and on for about 15 years. Okay. So, and what do you use for hollowing? I have a Jameson system. You like it? It's okay. I, th I think there's better ones out there, but uh, I've not made the plunge to make a change. So it does what I need to do uh, for the time being. Okay. This next piece is a piece of cherry that uh, you can see I carved some feet on the bottom of it. Obviously, this is a takeoff from some of the stuff that Chris Ramsey does. Uh, I've done a, a, a few of these kind of pieces, kind of fun. Um, the, belk, the bark held on this one real well, so I was pleased with that. That's a nice piece. Um, what are the feet on the bottom? Are those carved in or is, those, is that added on? No, they're carved in. Okay. Yep. So. This uh, bowl I recently turned, it's Osage orange, and then I turned, there's 13 spheres in here out of varying kind of woods. We had a um, presence challenge at our club to turn spheres, and so I, I worked on these 13, and they didn't come out too bad. I, I did make a uh, homemade sphere cutting jig a few years ago but I only used it on one of these. Otherwise, I just uh, used a, um, a half circle, I guess, the right diameter as my gauge as I went about turning the, the spheres, but it didn't come out too bad. Do you turn by making them an octagon first or do you, or, or what? Yes. Yeah. 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 I, that, I think that way works really well. Angelo taught me that. Yeah, that's what works for me. This next one, uh, when we moved into our place here, there was an old root from, I don't know if it was a tree or a big bush or something out in the yard. So I latched onto it and hung onto it for 
couple months and then put it on the lathe and here's what came from it. So uh, I was pleased that it hung together the, the way it did and it's kind of a unique piece. Nice piece. So the next thing, I don't know how many of you guys use a carving stand, but you may be familiar with Jerry Bennett. He's a great turner from down in Texas. He was featured on the front of AAW magazine, I think back in 19. But anyway, I saw this in one of his YouTube. So I emailed back and forth with me and he was tremendous in offering some suggestions and sending me some photos. But obviously I was able to get an old bowling ball and, and uh, bought a bolt that I planted in there and I can screw my chuck on there and uh, use it to, um, you know, carve feet. Uh, I can use it to, um, uh, I'll do a number of different things that you would do with it, typically with a carving stand. That's very cool. Um, the, the one thing that I'm trying to do is come up with a different way to, to um, tighten the thing up and, and loosen it when I want to move it. But obviously, you can move it any way you want to. So I don't know if you guys have had any experience with using a carving stand, but this is what I consider a poor man's carving stand, and it works for me and does what I need it to do. You might try a turnbuckle to hold those the cable in there. You know, Bill, I did try one, and I don't have enough gap here. Uh, it was too close to the ball, so I, I did try that. Okay. So, where'd you get the used bowling ball? You know what? I called a couple bowling local bowling alleys, and uh, the first one didn't have anything. The guess the uh, second gal said, "Yeah, come on over. I, we can find you one." So my wife and I went over there and. And she said, well, let me go get one. She brought it back and it was a real heavy one. And she, and I said, well, you wouldn't happen to have any that would be typically used by a, a kid. She said, sure. So she went somewhere else and came back with this bowling ball and very, very gracious. She gave it to me and we had taken along a little box that I had turned. So we gave her that box just in appreciation for the bowling alley or bowling ball. But yep, I got it from bowling alley. Yep, they were gonna pitch it anyway. I had a, 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 a physicist a teacher come by one time with a bowling ball that he wanted cut exactly in half. Uh, and we figured out how to do that on the lathe one day too. And I was very surprised at what's inside them. You should cut one in half sometime. You, <laughs> it's not what you think. It's not solid, that's for sure. Yeah, I've never done that. So anyway, that's all I've got, John. Okay. Just wanted to share with those with you guys. Okay, well, I want to ask you a couple of questions while we're here. I'm going to pull kill the share. Um, I'm going to keep the spotlight on you if I, well, maybe I'm not. Um, anyway, what, tell us about your home club a little bit. You're, you're in Indiana, so what's your, what, what's your club about? Well, um, it's Indiana, Kentucky, Illinois. We're right in the kind of the corner of uh, the state in the Tri-City area. And we've got about, I think, between 30 and 40 members right now. It's not a real big club, but we get together and, and, um, most of our demos are from people, you know, in the club, but we do bring them in from outside right now. And then we had Chris Ramsey was here a few years ago. We've had John Lucas here. We've had John Jordan here. So we've had a few good ones. We're a couple hours from Louisville. So uh, I've got a good friend of mine that's in the Louisville club. So uh, he was here last week and we spent some time together and He's currently the vice president of that club, and I'm the president of our club, so he's going to invite us to a, an event they're going to have in early March where they're bringing in a, a professional turner, and we'll be able to go over there and share and they're going to share that with us, so that's good. So are you going to go to the Louisville Symposium this summer? I, I do plan to get over there. I think I'm going to have a conflict, but I'm going to make sure I get there at least one day. So Have you been to some but, national yeah. symposiums before? I have. I've been to Atlanta, Kansas City, and Raleigh. Okay. So, so, so you're yeah. you're an experienced turner, and you've been around the, uh, the 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 symposia kind of events for a while. Yeah. Yeah. So. And what's your lay? First one I ever went to, matter of fact, was Atlanta, and Mike. I sat through one of your presentations down there, and it was great. What's your lathe? What do you turn on? I have an American Beauty, well, robust American Beauty. All right. Anybody got any yeah. questions for Roger? Yeah, this is Ken Vasco. 
I was just wondering how you uh, held the bolt into that without, there's a lot of pressure on whenever you do any uh, carving. How does, how does it stay in there? How do I hold the ball? No, how do you hold the bolt in there? Oh, oh okay. Well, I, when I drilled the hole out, I, I used the, uh, I think what was the thumb hole and uh, drilled it out and then I epoxied it in there. The epoxy's holding, huh? Yep, yep, so far, it's doing fine. Why do you think it wouldn't be, Ken? Vasco, you still there? He's muted himself. I've, I've got a question. Um, what are you, I'm looking at this thing, trying to figure out what you do with this. I, I heard you use the word carving several times. I take it you take your item out of your lathe and you're working on it with something else? That's correct. Yep, I take the chuck off the lathe and mount it on this uh, carving stand. And uh, like I used it a couple of days ago uh, to ho hold the bowl I was working on and I installed a cup of pewas in it. So you just have a lot more options to be able to position it that makes it easier to work on. But yeah, so I take the chuck off the lathe and screw it on there. And then you loosen the clamp in order to rotate the bowling ball to get it to be uh, the aspect you want to work on, right? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a question, um, Roger. The um, three upright pieces that uh, hold your ball, um, have they they got some kind of flex when um, you tighten the the clamp, or how do they they move? They are, they very are little, space plane, yeah. Not? yeah, very little flex because I have those uh, three supports fastened to the base that I've got them sitting on, so they can move, but very little, but enough to keep it tight. But the wood moves; the base plate doesn't doesn't move. I guess it's it's just that the, is correct you have in the in the upright pieces um that's correct would it be possible to use four of them then um that gives you a little bit more distance for your cord or your steel um cord and the turnbuckle if you want to use one i'm sure that a person could it may limit uh your ability to lower the position of the carving stand to get something to work on Okay. But I, I've not tried that, but it, it, it may work. But the ones that Jerry has made, he had three. And uh, he told me who he got the idea from. I forget who it was, but the one of the first ones that uh, he had seen, the guy had made a floor stand support mechanism, same concept, but it sat on the floor. Mine is just mounted to a base so I can take it from underneath a shelf and set it on top of an assembly table and clap it down and then use it like that. So it doesn't take up as much space for me. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot. Okay. Roger, why are you looking for a different way to hold that cable tight? I think that's rather ingenious with that quick clamp. Doesn't it make it tight enough? Is that the problem? You know, th that's a good question. I've only had one time where I couldn't get it tight enough. Uh, tight enough. I had a uh, pretty doggone heavy piece that I had on the chuck and um, it would not hold that. But what I was able to do is support the, the bolt from underneath to keep it from going too far. So only one time has it not been tight enough. Why, why don't you try a ho hose clamp, big hose clamp? All you need to do then is put a little wrench on to tighten it. A hose clamp? Um, yeah. You'd have to I've not tried that. Yeah. You'd have to put two or three of them together. Another solution, so. Yeah, just another another choice. Yeah, that's that's probably a good idea. I'll probably give that a try. Thank you. Any more for Roger? Or should we move on? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Roger. That was uh, very interesting and uh, a good introduction. Um, I'm Thank gonna, you. I'm going to go over to Ray now. We, uh, what do you got, Ray? Thanks, John. Hey, we talked a couple of weeks ago about uh, vacuum setup. So I got one of those velocity stacks and tried it. And it, it's interesting that uh, uh, noise increased a little bit. But what I found interesting, which is nice for me, is I use stay put 
uh, hoses and it slips right inside of that. So I can put it on, take it off. And uh, the only thing I had to do different was it adds a little bit of weight to the hose. So uh, I just have to put uh, something just to support the weight and balance it. But initially it looks like a good idea. Uh, you got pictures? You know, what's that? You got a picture? Uh, no, I got some other stuff coming. I'll, I'll put a picture in with that. Okay. But uh, I, you know, I, I, what was nice is that it fit into the hose without having to rig something. So it kept the weight at the end of the hose, uh, you know, controllable. I found the same thing. I, I, I bought a $25, $20 velocity stack online and it plugs right into the end of my vacuum hose. Yeah, that uh, makes it nice. Barry turned one. Uh, we posted the drawing last week, and um, I think you had a, a catch on that, and it came off and hit you in the face, if I remember right. But that's uh, another story. We'll get to Barry in a minute. <laughs> I want to go to Gary Mayhew first. We haven't heard from Gary in a long time. Gary, how are you? I just have a show and tell. I could uh, show um, I have a... Um, this is a piece of uh, walnut that I... Yeah, hold it I, up. I um, rough turned about over a year ago, and I'm still playing around with the, um, I don't know if you guys can see that, the butterfly inlays. Okay. Nice. So that's some maple, and uh, there's like an inclusion in the wood. I don't know if you could tell from the, uh, yeah. from this, but uh, so I put maple on that side. And then in this side, the um, sapwood had checking, so I put some wang A in that one. So... You're on Long Island, aren't you, Gary? I am. What what's your I home? was at the... You were at the Human Atlantic. Me? Yeah. I was, yes, we met. Yeah. What's your home yeah. club? Say, uh, say, excuse me? What is your home club? Um, so the home club, we have, I have two, actually. One is in Smithtown, which is a big main club, and then we have a SIG, a turning SIG, which has about, uh, I would say, about 60 members. And then I have a, a, a bigger club over in um, Northport High School. We, we actually meet in the Northport High School uh, tech room. So it's all woodworking. That's pretty cool. We have about 75 members in that one. And how long have you been turning? Uh, about 10 years. And what do you turn on? What's your lathe? I have an American Beauty. And what's the finish on that bowl? This is uh, Danish oil, and I buffed it out with the Beal buffing system. Very nice looking finish. I've been um, rounding my bases to this is this is convex, kind of matches the inside. Nice. Um, nice. Yeah, it's a lot of fun playing with these butterflies, though. I'm getting into that. Very nice. I use the Trent Bosch uh, Trent Bosch bobbing stand, which is pretty cool. I could use it in the in the uh, on the lathe. You know, in the banjo, yeah. or I could actually, I made a bracket where I could just uh, mount it to my bench. Nice. Do you do general work at woodworking as well? Like furniture and stuff? I, I do, but I've been getting so into turning that I haven't done a lot of furniture in a while. A few cabinets here and there, but that, I've been doing mainly uh, turning lately. Any questions for Gary? Nice work, Gary. Thank you. You got anything else, or are we going to take the spotlight off you? No, that's it. Okay. Uh, let's see. Who else we got here that we haven't heard from? Uh, we Okay. Garold, what do you have? Oh, a couple times we've been discussing um, our first turnings. And so I have my first turning today uh, approximately 58 years ago. I uh, did this turning in college. Like I say, my first one, you can see it's laminated cherry. Uh, you can see the glue joints rather evident. Uh, I gave this to my mother. Uh, they lived in Florida. The humidity down there with, and this was, you know, 58 years ago, we used white glue and it's separated. So I had to re-glue it at one time and put it back together. Uh, I call this my mid-century modern lamp. And um, that's just about it. Didn't, and techniques have improved since that time. Uh, yeah. you know, well, wait a minute. What's it mounted on? Is that a, is that the base that we're seeing there? Yes, that's a base. Just, uh, what it looks kind of small for a lamp that size. Uh, it's cherry, and uh, it seems to be fine. 
Okay. Doesn't seem to be. Okay. Okay, that's that was what I had. That's it from you? That's it from me today. <laughs> okay. I want to go to Mike. What do you have, Mike? Okay, I've got a quick picture of a uh, kind of a sanding stand. Yeah, so this is, uh, I made a video of this will come out next week. Just a simple, uh, simple screen. I got this idea from a picture in Richard Raffin's book. Uh, I'd made one of these sanding discs and I thought, well, I'll just leave this thing semi-permanently attached to my little teaching lathe. Uh, so if I just need a quick sanding job, I can just take a few steps over and do it. And, and it's easily taken off the lathe if I need to use the lathe. Just scraps. And the stand is to get you right on center line there so you can use it like a dish yeah. sander. Yeah. 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 Nothing special. Mike, how often do you put up a new video? Every week. Do you, I, and it's all it's all through Zoom, right? Um, through Zoom, YouTube. Yeah. And how many subscribers do you have on YouTube? I have 50,000. Wow. Holy cow. <laughs> They must love you. How many viewers do you get for typically on a video? Oh, gosh, it, it varies between, uh, you know, maybe a couple thousand and 5,000 or 8,000. It kind of varies, but I've had a total of eight. I've been doing it eight years, so I've got uh, 8 million views. Oh, that's yeah, amazing. So, so let's stop the share. Any, any questions that... before stop the share? Any questions on that? Let's see if there's any questions. Okay. You change the sandpaper. Uh, every now and then, I just it's just a regular sheet of sandpaper with some uh, spray adhesive. Uh, you know, if, I don't use it a whole lot, so it lasts a long, long, pretty long time. But I could, I figured I could hit it with a heat gun and slap another piece on there with some adhesive. Okay. Good. Nice. Any other questions? Okay. Toby. Thanks. Oops. Okay. Before I try and share my screen, <laughs> here's my first bowl that I made. This was uh, March of 2012. Wow. That's walnut? Yes, it's walnut. And what were you turning on and with at the time? Uh, this was an old, I think it was a general, big heavy thing. And what do you I bought from somebody off of Craigslist, I think. What were you using for turning tools? Uh, I had a bowl gouge, same one I still have. <laughs> okay. Three eighth inch bowl gouge. Nice, nice for a first piece. A lot, of, a lot of sanding on there. I bet there is, <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, it was un undercut here, that was. That was pretty tricky. Yeah. <laughs> Challenging shape for a first bowl. <laughs> yeah. Are you gonna show us some slides? I'm going to try and share my screen here. Usually works for you. Let's see if this is it. Doesn't look like it. Yes, it is. There we got it. You see that? Okay. You bet. This is uh, English walnut from my brother's backyard. He was a fairly large tree he cut down. It has a little bit of uh, white rot. It was sitting around for a while. And what's your finish on that? Uh, this. Just the spray clear spray clear lacquer or clear varnish? It's it's uh, it's not Rustoleum. What's the other Krylon triple thick coating? They yeah. call it. I don't know. Is it's that yeah. acrylic? Yeah, it's acrylic. Do you buff it? Are those finishes food safe? I assume it is. I don't know. I believe it is. Do you buff yeah, it after you put it on, or do you just spray it on and leave it alone? No, I buff it then later to get the nibs off and, and smooth out some of the little pebbles or what on there. And this one is uh, 13 by five and a half. I don't usually do large pieces, but this is one of them. Is that the same piece from the side? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Very nice piece. Nice piece of wood. Yeah, English walnut has really nice coloration in the grain. So that's all. Okay. Wait, what was that that came up next? Something else came up there. 
Well, this, this is, I just finished this yesterday and, and uh, that's the bottom of this piece. It's uh, Maple Burl. Once in a while, I'll take uh, before and after shots when I post on Facebook, because people don't know what it looks like. So I'll, I'm going to dye this piece. So I'll show it like this and then I'll show it after I dye it. What color? Right now it has a coat of blue on it. I'm going to put red over top of it and see how that turns out. It really brings the uh, the figure in the wood, which you can see there, but it doesn't pop out like it does when you put uh, dye on it. It's the inside. And you're using those dyes that are like uh, just a drop of dye in, in, in water, is that right? It's trans tint dye, yes. Trans tint. And I mix it with water. You can use alcohol. What would be the difference between water and alcohol? Uh, the alcohol dries up a lot quicker and uh, it smells and you have to buy it. Does it raise it the grain? It doesn't raise the grain. It doesn't raise the grain, yeah. But generally, after on my final sanding on the lathe, I'll spray it down with water and then then uh, re-sand it again with uh, 320 to take the raised grain down. And you do that water, after dyeing? The water is a little easier to blend the colors with, isn't it? That's true also, yes. Huh. I, I'm going to have to get some dye and try it. I think that's amazing. Maybe I'll bring some to a workshop one day. Okay, that would be good. Anything else you're going to show us? Nope, that's it. Okay. I want to end your share. Any questions for Toby? Toby, you keep talking about one drop. I I get no coloration if I don't put more than one drop in. I, you must be have magic hands with well, it. Well, about about two tablespoons of water in a little little cup, and then maybe maybe a uh, two or three drops it's not really one drop it depends on I usually put two coats on too because I want to see what the effect is plus it blends in better with your, your two coats and yeah, what's the brand of dye trans tint comes in a two ounce bottle it's liquid I, I think I just found the answer I use a lot more than two tablespoons I use alcohol that's my problem. I'm using way too much base liquid. You're only using right. two tablespoons, then a couple drops does have some strength. Yeah, on, on most pieces, you don't I need much to, to put a yeah. coat on. That's exactly yeah, right. Would turn so. zoom and, uh, have you used the powder dyes? How, how do the powder dyes compare to this liquid dye? I, I actually do have some uh, Procyon powder dye. And uh, when I mix it up, I found that if I heat the water in the microwave to almost boiling, and then mix, mix the dye up. It, it does a much better job of dissolving the dye. And then and then use that the same way I do the trans tint dye. Do you get the same colorations and grain enhancement from the powder dyes or do you prefer the liquid dye? No, it's about the same. The colors in the Procyon are a little more vivid, but that's maybe just the colors that I picked out, you know, what I ordered. Thanks. Yep. Anybody else on this? Okay. Thank you very much, Toby. Uh, Bruce, we haven't heard from you in a while. What do you got? Well, I continue to challenge myself with casting, which I think I should probably get out of that business, but I, I can't help myself. Um, what do you like about I... it? What, 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 what attracts you? What's intriguing? The result. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think is probably the best way to say it. Um, I, I, I don't I enjoy the turning as much, but I enjoy the process a bit, I guess. So I had this piece of Biddle Box Burl, um, which I wasn't quite sure what to do with. Uh, it's an Australian Burl. The, um, it, it looks great, but boy, I tell you, it was one of these Burls that's kind of sticky, dusty when you turn it. It wasn't, uh, wasn't particularly a lot of fun to turn. But I, I decided to cut it the way you see the crack is already in it. And I thought I could use this little piece on the side, but it didn't work out that way. But uh, in any case, this is kind of how it looks in a very large mold. This is a 15 inch mold. Um, and my intent was to capture the natural edge on one side, which is over here, uh, and then try and cut it such that you had most of the burl along the rim so that I got most of the rim covered with burl. 
Um, and the downside of that is you really have to cut the edge of the burl so there's enough depth of the burl to make that come through. Um, but it seemed to work out. Well, so just, removed from the mold, it kind of looks Just like, a second, what's all that junk on top of it? Um, <laughs> that is weight, because one thing that can happen to you when you are uh, casting is that your wood can float. So uh, it's usually a good safety. Uh, when I make a mold, I'll often glue it to the bottom. In this case, I've just got heavy weights all along it so that it does not float. Well, let's just, just a second here. Are you using some special epoxy or plastic that we wouldn't, I mean, I know you're a polymer chemist. You must have uh, some views on that. Um, no, and, and actually epoxy tends to be one of the heavier, denser materials. So then if you have a wood, that, a particular burl that's very, very dry, it's going to be light. Some of the burls are going to be heavy. In this case, I'm not sure it was an issue, but it's always uh, the prevention is definitely better than the cure than when you're starting to pour and the wood is floating all over the place and you can't align it. Um, but no, actually, I'm using Canadian epoxy, actually. It's called uh, designer epoxy. comes from a company in Canada, which is able to be poured, I believe, at least four inches deep, which is why I like it. Uh, although on a platter here, I'm only pouring about an inch and a half to two inches of, of epoxy. Uh, two standard two-part system. This one is a two-to-one mix, John, if you care. But uh, otherwise, it's nothing special, uh, except that I like the way it works. Um, all right. So then on the lathe, I, I guess should be kind of cold out is the way I do this is the part that's on top is the bottom of the bowl with the intent of aligning the burl to the surface to get the bottom of the casting, the top of the bowl, if that makes sense. Not yet, but let's see where no. you go next with it. Maybe we'll get it. All right, so, so in turning it, uh, where was I? So this is it on the lathe, taking those excess pieces out and then making the, the piece out here. But what you really care about and what I wanted was the natural ledge, which you can see here at the top, is going to be pulled out when you hollow out the bowl from the other side. So I believe I'm going to pull the wrong picture up. I think no. So that's that is the platter now that has been hollowed, and what you can see on the top here is that natural edge I was going for, and it doesn't show that well in the picture, but. Uh, when you light this up, you can see right through the, uh, the epoxy and you can actually see the spikes of the burl coming out in the middle. But unfortunately, the picture just doesn't capture it that well. Is, is, that this the top, is, is this the top of the platter or the back? This is the top. Okay. This is hollowed in a nice um, gradual uh, arc. Here, here's the other side. Okay. Now I'm starting to see it. Okay. And then I, I've kind of settled. I kind of like this rim design that I've been playing with and uh, going to use it a little more. But I think what this encouraged me to the fact that I really like the natural edge here. And the next ones I'm making is to try and put the whole burl on the inside and leave the natural edge all around the platter. And uh, I've got two that I've casted that are going to be that design, hopefully. So uh, and, and what we'll do see you, how that plays. What are you turning that epoxy with? Um, I guess we've had that discussion before, and uh, I really like these simple woodworking tools, they're called, um, and they make a resin cutter, uh, which is a round carbide cutter, and I find it superior to anything else I've tried, and I even, um, I guess through this forum was recommended to try the Easy Wood Tools um, negative rake, and I find that even that, that tool still um, gets me uh, shattering of the epoxy, unless I'm really careful. But the Easy Wood Tool resin cutter, I think it's coated AR or something like that, seems to get me the smoothest, nicest cut. And here you've got a pretty different hardness, clearly, between the epoxy and the burl as you do this. Um, but it works quite well. Well, Bruce, I have a question in regards to the type of epoxy. You mentioned that this is designed to pour thicker. 
the reason I asked that question is I poured some uh, last week on a uh, on a sink bowl and I had trouble at the bottom with bubbles and I could not heat the bubbles out. So do the various epoxies make a difference in that regard? So I have never resorted to the heat. Um, and, and the way I described it is the part that I've poured is the bottom of the bowl. So if I get a bubble, it's usually on the part I'm gonna uh, turn away. So it doesn't really bother me. But the deep pour epoxies cure very, very slowly. This one has about a three day uh, period before you can remove it from the mold and a seven day fully cure. And I find that it's, it's fairly thin when you put it in there and you will see some bubbles particularly when you cast it on a burl, but they all come to the surface quite quickly. And uh, I've never really, well, I shouldn't say, uh, I haven't so far in, in a bunch of castings had any trouble with bubbles uh, from that. And they just come to the surface, they go away. And yes, a lot of people do recommend taking a torch to it to get the bubbles to go away. And I guess if you do that while it's still thin enough, uh, and in this case, probably in the first few hours, you can do that. But I, I, I haven't needed that. And with the very slow curing epoxies, I've never put them into a pressure pot or had any problem with that with bubbles. But if you go with a fast cure epoxy, then you're going to have that problem. So the slow cure epoxy that you're using, say again the name of the company that you're getting it from. Designer Epoxy is the, is the brand. So yeah. if we go online and look for Designer Epoxy, we might find it. You should definitely find it, and it's it's Canadian. Doesn't seem to be a problem coming across the border, though. I get it fairly quickly in the U.S. Okay. Any other questions for Bruce? Okay. Um, uh, Jeff says that designer epoxy is available on Amazon. So there you go. And Mike noted earlier that Chromacraft premix dyes. He likes those. So there's three kinds of dye. Um, Bowman. Designer epoxy does come in in different formulas, though. And th this is the deep pour one. I think that's important, the deep pour, isn't it? It is important. Yeah. I'd like to piggyback on Bruce. Uh, I'm pouring, uh, and I have pictures of this, but I'm trying to give you a sense of perspective. By the way, John, one of the things about this camera from the iPhone it doesn't have the lag that the normal video cameras do but well, I'm in blur so that's well, what's happening here yeah blur so is a problem I'm gonna show I'm gonna show you the pictures I just want you guys to get a sense of this is a poured with a, a root in it or a, or a, a part from a, a crotch a walnut a walnut vase in the middle which serves as the handle and a square, a square cut at one, a square cut bottom. Um, and it's not a funnel, just in case I get accused of that. I had to turn it from top and bottom to, Stu, I just want to make sure you know it wasn't a few, uh, funnel. So, and let me, let me share screen now real quick here. You got a minute. It looks like a ring bowl for a giant. <laughs> well, that would be, a, that would be a matter of doing it. Okay. Sorry uh sharing screen right here we go and this this again as i do this is from a couple different sides um so it gives you a sense of of uh what's on each side without it going around so um there are more here of course had to do some fun with it uh, the handle base thing that's that's from old oak i'm saying old because the tree is dead a long time on the homestead and we cut it down and made some lumber out of it and it's a very old very dry oak well i kind of see but, what what you're doing here but i still i'd like to hear why why this why you're doing this what are you trying to do i love i love the random patterns that happen uh you never quite you can plan a little bit like bruce is trying to do but you never quite know. It's just an exploration, you know. It's just, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I find, uh, I just find it a challenge, you know. So, yeah, what am I trying to do? It's just a piece of art, you know. I, okay. And this one actually can be a, 
a candy bowl or whatever. But you're in, finished, you're interested yeah. in the shapes in the wood that show up against the plastic. Is that is that what intrigues That's you? That's it. Yeah. So the the challenge is to then choose the right kind of color, the right amount of transparency. If you have this sitting on the table and a light shining across, it's it glows from inside. Although this this is maybe at its thickest spot, three eighths or maybe even a half. I don't tend to turn real thin. I'm happy to uh, see it isn't blue. <laughs> yeah, well, I know. You keep saying, why do you keep making blue? Well, I haven't made a blue one for a long time or a turquoise one. Because <laughs> I teased you I, out of it. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I have, uh, Bruce has been helpful to me on, uh, uh, I use negative rake scrapers. And I've been using some that I got from who? I just went the other day and ordered one. Maybe it was Easy Wood or something. Easy, easy Wood, is that what it is? I use their scrapers in my tools. And I don't get any chipping. It's, it's, uh, you you go a little slow, but yeah, it's, I have fun with it. I, I'm, this piece to me is one of my prize ones, it's, honestly. It's uh, a very think. attractive piece. I, I agree with that. Uh, yeah. yeah. I just killed your share so we can get back to the gallery. Yep. Or the speaker or whatever we're looking at. Cause we're right yeah. on the hour. And uh, as always, it's a fun hour. I learned a lot about epoxy here today that I didn't know before. There's another chat. I'm bringing the chats up on my screen. You can't see them, but they will be on the recording. So that's a way of getting the chats into the recording without having to do any gymnastics. So now they're in there too. Carl says Armalite is the other brand he uses. I've heard other people talk about Armalite. Yeah, I... Alumalite also makes the polyurethanes. Uh, they make, I uh, believe, epoxies and uh, polyurethanes. Okay. I've been less happy with Aluma Light, and they really need a pressure pot to kill the bubbles. I that use would be the polyurethanes, yes. You yeah. absolutely need a I, pressure pot. I use, uh, I think this one was liquid ga glass, actually. They're the, probably the oldest U.S. company making, uh, making epoxies. Uh, I use Wisebond, too. The local guy that pours a lot of tables uses Wisebond, and occasionally I buy it from him because he buys a lot of it so yeah and with that kids it's another uh, another hour has delightfully passed uh thank you for joining us today i'll have the recording up uh, probably with next week's invitation i'm finding it a lot easier for me if i give myself some time to do the recording and pick at it a bit um and we'll see you all next week Whoa.